Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Todd Schultz, and I'm a senior application engineer here at the MathWorks. Today's webinar will demonstrate the use of MATLAB for analyzing wind data for a potential wind farm site. While today I'm focusing on a specific application, the software, the analysis, the techniques, and the concepts that I'll show can be applied to a broad range of problems outside this application. So let's get sailing. Now in the course of working with this data, I found two important characteristics of a software environment helpful to accomplishing this analysis. First, I wanted to fully automate calculations, visualizations, and reporting that are repetitive and standard. The reason is simple, to save time. I will want to generate these calculations and visualizations for every site and data set that I look at. Therefore, I'd like this to be simple, easy, fast, and not require a lot of mouse clicks from me. Second. I want the flexibility to explore interesting and unique phenomena that are within a set of wind measurements or across multiple data sets. The standard analysis can't account for everything, and I want to add my own ideas in creative exploration. There may be a unique feature that I can take advantage of at a particular site. Maybe I can recall patterns across multiple sites that will give me an edge at finding the next great wind farm site. In the end, I'm exceeding the standard analysis generating additional and unique knowledge that I can use as a competitive advantage. These two characteristics fit in the middle of our data analysis workflow. While we'll be seeing these two characteristics in action in the upcoming demo, there is more to MATLAB and our workflow. We'll also see how to import our data, potentially from a variety of sources such as data files and databases. We'll see additional techniques for data exploration and sharing our results in the form of design inputs and reports. Also, we'll see how to connect all of these pieces together in a single platform. So let's see how MATLAB gives us this platform. Our story is simple. A coastal town in Massachusetts is considering installing a wind turbine on town-owned land for power generation. They had a meteorological tower installed on May 25th and decommissioned a year later. Should they install the wind turbine? Let's find out. I have an analysis script written in MATLAB, which I'm going to execute. It is currently executing the script and running the analysis as defined by me. It acquired the data off of our database where the logger was storing the data and performing the necessary calculations to help us answer the question of whether or not to install the wind turbine at the site. It's checking to make sure the data is first of good quality, second that the results make sense, and then calculate our statistical analysis results giving us both numeric and displayed results. Let's watch while the analysis script finishes and provides us with our standard report. And here we can see our report that was generated for us by MATLAB with a single click of a button. We have up top a title with text describing our analysis and the functions that we did. Below that we can see our standard table of contents outlining the sections of this report and the analysis that was done for us. Let's quickly go through this report. The first section is importing a map that was generated using MATLAB in the mapping toolbox to help us identify the site at which we installed the meteorological tower. Next section we imported the data. This data was imported from a database file and brought directly into MATLAB. You can also read data in from a variety of different file types and other sources. After having the data brought into MATLAB we decided to do a quick check to ask the question of our data doesn't make sense. Upon visual inspection in the temperature data, we can see in the beginning of it that the data really doesn't make sense. It's nice to have this graph allow us 
to ask those questions and make these judgments. We wouldn't expect the temperature to be minus 90 degrees in May and June in the Boston area. So we will have to do something with this data to correct for it. And that's what the next sections in our report are for, data quality assurance. We're going to perform a series of tests on our data to identify data observation points that do not make physical sense with regards to our pre-existing knowledge of the area. First we test for missing date ranges, prepare the data for data quality assurance. We assume that all data is good and that as each data point fails the test, we'll move it from pass to fail. Missing values, clipped values, so all data have passed these tests. The first test we see any failures is abnormal temperatures. So it identified that these were abnormal temperatures by our request, and we see that 6,668 observations were identified as having abnormal temperature values. Therefore, something must have been wrong with our sensor. Well, this was noticed during the testing. The sensor was replaced, thus giving us the good data afterwards. More complicated tests are also carried out considering icing conditions. These sensors are exposed to the elements and could possibly have ice form on them that could impact their performance and calibrations. This test looks for those type of conditions and alerts us to that possibility. You can see that there is quite a few additional points that have failed the icing test. We can look to see if some of the sensors were stuck as they are moving sensors, moving entities. And upon completion, we have a listing of what observations have failed some type of quality assurance test. At this point, we have a decision to make. How do we deal with this data that we know has quality issues? For simplicity's sake, this demonstration, it will delete the entire time observation point for each observation that had a data point fail a quality assurance test. This is also called row-wise deletion. Now in the field you may not want to delete all of the data, even data that have not uh, impacted by poor data quality. So you can have other options to do. You could just delete the one data point out of the time observation that failed, leaving the remaining ones or you could do substitution, some least squares fit or minimum substitution to, to estimate what the value should have been if there was not a failure within the sensor. But again, for simplicity's sake, row-wise row deletion was selected. And at this point, 85% of our observations passed the data quality assurance testing, which gives, leaves us with a still large number of observation points for use. And we'll use those observation points to carry out the remaining of our statistical analysis. Again, first, just replot, again, to make sure everything makes sense and that we didn't affect the data in an adverse way. We can start calculating our statistical quantities, such as estimating the wind velocity at the height at which we propose to install the wind turbine. The meteorological towers are usually much shorter than the the height at which the turbine will be installed, so we have some mechanism to predict what the wind would have been at that time. Look at the wind distribution. So what percentage of the time that we measured was the wind blowing at a particular velocity or speed? In this case, we can see the dominant one is 5 meters per second at a measurement of 49 meters. We can carry the same analysis out very quickly for the remaining of our sensors. Now another important gr graph analysis for wind turbine resource understanding is the wind rows. We not only want to know at what speeds were the wind blowing at, but where did it come from? In this case we can see for again for the same sensor at 49 meters, the predominant wind direction was from the southwest followed by north, uh, north northwest. And again, we have the remaining for the thing. Now, these graphs were, are not built in default MATLAB figures. These figures were created by an, 
an, a user of MATLAB like yourselves who posted the file up to our file exchange community called MATLAB Central. The benefit of this is that you have not only the math work supplying products and functions that you can use, but a whole user community also supplying products and functions that you can use to do your work. So you don't necessarily always have to start from scratch if we don't provide it for you. You can look onto MATLAB Central see if there's someone that's done similar work and use that as a starting point or a solution for yourself to save time. We can look at our data in different ways resampling for average monthly averages wind speeds or hourly diurnal average. Also look at the turbulence intensity. Turbulence intensity is a measure of somewhat of the gustness of the wind which would impact the reliability of the turbine and the maintenance schedule required for the turbine installed at this location. Again, all these are displayed here. Again, the shear profile estimating the wind velocity up at altitude, typically 80 to 100 meters where the wind turbine would be installed. After our statistical analysis is done, we can start to make our predictions of what type of power capability could we extract from that wind resource that is blowing. In this case, I've broken it up into two segments, one being a short-term estimate, short-term meaning just using the data that I measured locally at this one site. And here I went ahead and estimated the, the short-term average power that we could extract and the short-term capacity factor assuming installing a wind turbine rated at 1.5 megawatts. We can see that the estimated short-term power was 460 kilowatts and the short-term capacity factor was 31 percent. But if we're going to install this in turbine, we would want it to last for the long term. We'd like to have some idea of the long averages of this site, not just the one-year local averages. In order to do that, we can carry out a measure correlate predict method to compare our local site which we have one year's of data worth to a site nearby that has decades worth of data stored. In this particular case the nearby local site was chosen to be Boston's Logan International Airport weather station. Correlating my results and using it as a regression, I can estimate the long-term wind speed at hub height for my local site at 6.9 meters per second, which translates into a capacity factor of 32%, very close to my original one. So at the end of this report, we have all the numbers that we need from the local wind resources to judge whether or not this is a good site to make and install a turbine here. We could carry out the analysis further, looking into the financials and the economic conditions, and make an, a decision whether or not it will be a profitable site. But MATLAB has given us that analysis with one push of a button. But this isn't all that MATLAB can do for us. Let's see how we can use MATLAB now to explore data further and go beyond this standard report. In order to do that, I'm going to use a subset of the data. We're just going to look at one month's worth of data for simplicity's sake. I have that stored here, November 2007, in this comma-separated values file. I'm going to analyze it in MATLAB. I'm first going to have to load this data into MATLAB, which can be accomplished by simply double-clicking on it in our current folder window. This brings up the import wizard that allows me to simply step through the process of importing my data. Now within MATLAB, I have two new variables, one called data, which is 4,320 by 4, and is double, double precision numbers, so numerical values. And I have text data, which is 4,321 by 5, and it is a cell array. So let's take a look at these double-clicking them, we can open up the variable editor and see that data is simply extracting numerical values for me, whereas text data has extracted the headers for me. And we see in my original file that we had a column called date with the date time samples, and we can see that we had samples every 10 minutes. The following columns were the velocity at 49 meters, the velocity at 38 meters, the velocity at 20 meters, and then the temperature at 3 meters. So 
data is the variable that contains all of those numeric values for those three velocity measurements and temperature measurements. Now we can use MATLAB to go ahead and analyze and work on these variables. First, let's extract just one column worth of data. Clicking on the upper header, right-clicking, and creating a variable from that new selection. Give it a more meaningful name, V49 for velocity at 49 meters. We now have a new variable, and we can see it's just a copy of that data. And the nice thing is, though, as a separate variable, we can simply select it, use the plot picker, and quickly generate a graphic displaying that data so we can start asking the question whether or not this data makes sense or are there errors that we should deal with. And in this quick graph we can see that there are some values that are at minus approximately minus 99 meters per second. Well this is obviously not expected and should be investigated further. And with knowledge of the data logger that was used, this is the code used by the data logger to indicate an error. So these are error points that need to be removed. So I can simply remove them from the figure using my mouse and get a better picture of the actual true data now with the scales adjusted for that. We can interrogate our data and ask for actual values at particular points, including the maximum that we have identified. You can see the maximum wind velocity was 18.34 meters per second, and it occurred at an index number of 370. Now that may be interesting, but it would be really more interesting if we could correlate that index number to the date and time at which that measurement was taken. So let's see how we can do that. We're going to go in and index into our text data to find the appropriate date time stamp. So we'll just call the variable text data in our command window. We want to index into it and we want row and column number. So it was 370, but we have to add one because text data has the headers information in it as well. And we want column one. And MATLAB returns us the value that was stored in that element of our array and it was on the 3rd of November at 1.30 p.m. Also I want you to notice quickly in the command window when we select the, the toolbar button the plot picker to generate that plot MATLAB echoed a command to their command window. MATLAB's not trying to be some kind of black box hiding the analysis on you we're trying to help you understand what we're doing and in doing so we are providing you with the function that we executed to generate that plot. All right, so we found one way to find our maximum. But if we're going to do this frequently, we probably want some type of programmatic way. So we can ask MATLAB if it has functions. Well, we can use the function browser over here to browse for them. So open that up. We'll just search for max. And we can definitely see the first function is available to us, max, largest element in an array. So MATLAB comes with quite an array of functions that we can use at our disposal. Search for the maximum of V49, and we get our answer return, 18.34 meters per second. But we don't just want the maximum value. We would also like the index at which that occurs. So now we're going to ask for two outputs from this function, one being the maximum value, which I will store in a variable called M, and one called I, which will store the index at which that occurred. And we can see now I has a value of 370. So if we want to use this, we can ask text data now for the data point where that occurred, remembering to adjust by one by the difference in length. And we get the return the same value. So at this point, we may choose that we want to see not only just that one line, but all three velocity lines. Well, we saw the command earlier was plot to generate a simple line plot. So let's plot data. We want to plot all of the rows, the entire column, but we only want columns one through three because column four was the temperature. We'll just simply input that into MATLAB. It figures out that we wanted three lines and displays them up for us. Well, this is useful. We can, uh, again, zoom in on our plot if we want. We can see the error codes. 
but let's make some adjustments to it to make it more meaningful to ourselves. Let's edit this plot. We can simply add labels so that we don't have to remember what was plotted, but we can have an understanding when we glance back at this after we've done additional work. So we'll label the x-axis as index number, the y-axis as wind speed. We can even label each line independently so we remember which one was at which height and even add a legend in as soon as we finish labeling the lines. The nice thing is th with our three figures we kind of see what we expect. The three lines are very similar to each other but they do look progressively lower. So at this point we have a nice figure that we may want to reuse for all of our sites to just get a basic understanding of the data. Now we don't want to have to waste time entering these repetitive labels in so MATLAB gives us a feature, File, Generate, M-File, which is going to generate a function in MATLAB in the MATLAB editor, which appeared, open here for us, that creates a new function that replicates the work that we just did in this figure. So it collected all the commands necessary to replicate that figure for us. Open it in the MATLAB editor. The MATLAB editor is just a text editor that understands the MATLAB syntax. So just to take advantage of this, we simply just save this function, create figure, and then can call it from the command line. Create figure and then provide it the data that we want. And we can see we have the exact figure replicated for us with labels as we described and legend as we put in. Now we could continue with this analysis and keep going, but we start to see that we're cluttering our workspace. We're adding more and more additional variables and losing organization. So we might ask ourselves, MATLAB, do you have a way to help us organize this data? Well, let's ask the function browser, data org. organization. And it helps if you can spell it correctly. And there we go. We have a category called data organization within our statistics toolbox. And we see one of the th categories is the data set array. And there's a function called data set. At this point, you could go into the help using the more help option to read about it. But this is a function that will help us create a container to better store our data. So let me clear all that we have now. Let's go ahead and use it. We'll create a variable called wind, call the data set command, and we're going to load it directly from the file. Data set, file, name of our file, and the delimiter is comma, hit enter. And we can see we have a new variable, one variable, wind, and it is a 4,000. 320 by 5 data set array. Well, being an array, we can index into it just as we did before. Let's ask for the first five elements of all five columns. And we can see we get the data just like we did before. But in this case, each column could be of a different data type than any other. So the first column is unique. It is a bunch of strings or ASCII characters whereas the remaining columns are double precision numeric numbers for calculation but yet they are organized together for us also notice that the header of each column has a unique variable name to it the ones that were actually stored in our file that we used so we can refer to each one of these data points by the row and column indices but we just as before we would have to remember which column correspond to which variable. With this data set array, we can now index in to the columns using the names instead of the numbers. So you have a choice. And we re are returned those first five values of the second column, which corresponds to V49. So you can use whichever one is more easily remembered for yourself. But we can also index into it using the dot notation so wind dot and then the name of the variable we wish and if we forget which ones are available we can even use the tab command to get a list presented to us and index into it just as we've done before so the data set 
array, data set array provides this convenient storage mechanism. And even though we have it stored this way, we can still use our function to create our figure. But now it's time to deal with this error code once and for all. Because we know it's some sort of error code in our, our logger, we'll want to remove it. So I can ask MATLAB, give me the indices where that data is equal to the error code. So I'm simply asking MATLAB a logical question. Where when dot v49 equals minus 99, where our error codes are present, let me have those indices. And I stored it in I, which is actually a 4,320 by 1 logical array. So it has an array of the same size of our input matrix, in this case the, vo the velocity vector, and stores one of two possible values, 0 or 1. 0 being false, this logical condition is false, 1 being the logical condition that we asked for is true. To better illustrate, let's use a simpler example, a smaller example. So I'll define a 3 by 3 magic, and I can simply ask i where a is greater than 7. And now you can see that what this logical array is, is it's simply a mask for that variable a. Substituting it in as the indices reference, and we see it returns to us the points at which that logical statement was true. The values of a were greater than 7. Well, that's one way to use it as an index, but you can actually use the logical statement itself to index in there and get returned the same values. And this step here is referred to as logical indexing. Using some type of logical statement, which could be more complex using AND and OR statements, to index into an array instead of numeric values. And once we have the logical index, we can use that for assignments saying, I know that any value greater than 7 is some type of fraudulent value and I want to replace it with 0, I can simply ask MATLAB to do that for me. Find A where A is greater than 7 and if, if it is, replace those with zeros. And now we have substituted 0 into our value. So that's exactly what we will do here. We, we call our logical mask for our vector. We can even ask MATLAB how many error codes we had, and we had four being a logical, just zeros and ones. We can actually ask the sum, and the sum would be the number of times truth was found. And then we can go into wind and start to do substitutions. The first one we could say, well, let's ignore it. Let's put in there NANDs, which stands for not a number. One of the possible methods, similar to our deletion that we used before. Well, we could also just simply use a minimum substitution. So take the minimum value, put it into where it was equal to zero. Now we've replaced those values and substituted them with another one. So as I stated before in our demonstration, with, we chose row-wise deletion. Substitution would have been another practical application that we could have used. Now this logical indexing, using logical statements to find where quality was lacking in our data, is exactly how I built up those data quality assurance tests. Very quickly and simply, you'll be able to develop your own for your own conditions that you w wish to test for. And now that I have it removed, we can go back to our create figure and look and see our figure now generated with those error codes replaced with the minimum value and get a better view, scaled in view of our figure and our data. So we have our data now, and we have a simple view of it, and we've corrected for a few things. Now it's time to go beyond. Let's take another look at our data. How else can we look at it? In this particular case, we're looking at 10-minute averages. Maybe we wish to look at the hourly averages. MATLAB's matrix mathematics will allow us to do this very quickly. I'm going to simply take my data, and I'm going to reshape it. So I have my data in there in the reshape command. I want columns with six elements in it, since there is six 10-minute segments in an hour. 
and then I want as many columns as it needs to store the entire data. I'll let MATLAB figure that out. I'll hit enter. So what did I just do? I create a new variable that's 6 by 720 and it's double so it's a bunch of numbers and we can simply see that each column now has six rows, six entries in it, representing the data for one particular hour. So if I want the hourly average, all I have to do is take the average of each column. And our mean operator does that for me. So the functions in MATLAB know how to work on arrays in their entirety. Some work on columns at a time, some work on rows, some work on the entire matrix at a whole, depending on what the function is. This mean operator by default works on columns at a time. There are optional parameters to adjust it to work on the rows at a time as well. And now that we have it, we can go ahead and plot those to see what it looks like. And we can see that our hourly averages are similar to our 10 minute averages. So we didn't really discover anything new here. But MATLAB enables to quickly investigate these and try out these interesting and unique explorations that we wish to do. Maybe the next thing we wish to do is create some type of simulator for this wind. We know this wind speed is somewhat random and we want to use it as an input to a model, a simulation that we have for our wind turbine and do some long-running simulation, a Monte Carlo simulation, to get a better understanding of the output power. For this, we would want to generate some type of statistical distribution or histogram. Well, there is a function, and we could find it in the function browser or the plot picker, but the command is simply hist, so we'll just start off with that. and we have our histogram displayed for us and we can start to look at the distribution. We can see this is not a very refined estimate of the histogram and I think we can do better. We'll do better by providing optional input parameters and we'll say we want the histogram from bins 0 to 20 in increments of 1 and those where the center of those bins should be. Now we see have a little more detail on our histogram and now we can start to explore it and ask what is this distribution and how can we best represent it? From visual inspection, we can see that it's not a normal distribution. We could call statistical hypothesis tests to confirm that, which are available in the statistics toolbox, but we'll just suffice with visual inspection. So we want to fit a distribution to this, to this histogram that we have. We'll fit, go ahead and call it a Weibull distribution, which is quite common in this type of data set. So we'll use our, again, our function browser to find fit distribution, because that's what we wish to do. We see that there's a function called fit disp, fit probability distribution to data, exactly what we want. So we'll store it as PD. We'll say fit disp, give it our data and say that we want a Weibull distribution to be fitted. Enter, and what's returned to us is this object we can see over here in our workspace browser, PD, is a one by one uh, object, just like our wind data. And it's storing quite a bit of information for us. First, it knows that it's a Weibull distribution that's supposed to be there, and it's storing the fitted values of the coefficients for that distribution, A and B. If we double click on it, we can see in the variable editor many more fields that are being stored with additional information, but this is all being organized for us in a clean manner, providing into our workspace one variable PD instead of littering it with many different variables. So if this is an object, a fitting object, we should be able to apply some kind of methods to it. So let's ask what its methods are. Methods PD enter and we can see one of them is random. So the random method would probably generate a random number based off of that method. So we'll say random PD, I just want one estimate and there we have it. We've actually took our measured data, created a histogram, used that data to fit a dis known distribution to it with coefficients that we can use to simulate the wind at this local site.
we can use this as an input to our model or simulation of our wind turbine to get a distribution of the output energy to better analyze it. But we wouldn't want to just simulate it once or twice. We would want to simulate it quite a few times. So once, not 10 times, not 100, not 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. How about a million? And we've just generated a vector x of 1 million double precision random numbers based on the probability distribution of our measured wind velocity. Now this would be the input for our simulation and I'll allow the Monte Carlo simulation to run a million times in order to get a true statistically converged simulation of our results. So now that we've done all this additional work, let's save our, our progress so that we remember what we do and if we want to be able to use it again. So the command window, which I've had behind my workspace browser, has been logging all of the commands that have been entered into the command window. And we can simply use control click to select the ones that we wish to save. With right-clicking, we can create an M file, again, another MATLAB file. In this case, it's not a function. The first word in it is not a function. It's simply copied those commands over to the editor for us so that we can save them and run them again later. First thing I want to note is this orange box over here on the editor. This is what we call Mlint, and you can think of it as your very own tech support person within the software trying to help you out. It's looking at the the functions and the commands that you have in your script here. And it's seeing if there's any suggestions. And it can take one of three possible states. Red, meaning we found an error and this script will not execute. Orange, in this case, we found warnings. We think there are ways to improve it. Or green, which we think that it's good. Now, we can't detect everything, but it is a truly valuable resource. The warm warning we have is down here. And it says on line 10, terminate statement with semicolon to suppress output within a script. So if this is something you would wish to do, in a lot of cases you can simply click the fix button, inserted the missing semicolon, and Emlet has now turned green for us. So it's helping us build better analysis scripts. But to really help build better analysis scripts, we should really add comments. And a single percent sign is a comment in MATLAB import data from file. But there's another kind of special comment in scripts, and they are indicated by a double percent sign, import data. And what this does is create cells within our script. Each cell runs from the start of one till the start of the next, and really helps us visually break up our script into logical sections that we define. So error handling. We'll just define a few more. That's the first benefit, the visual separation of these logical sections that we're defining. There'll be two other benefits of these cell cells in our script, which we call cell mode. I'll call this one last one, wind, wind simulator. So you can also use them to collapse them, to to just really focus down on the one section that you wish to focus down on. You can actually execute each cell independent from each other as long as the data that that cell requires is present in the workspace. So in this visualized data, it's calling our create figure. It needs that wind variable in the workspace in order to execute. Since it's there, we can now just execute this without executing the lines in front of it using the toolbar buttons evaluate cell. And we have our figure. Now to make this a little more useful, I'm just going to have some of these figures created in a new figure instead of overwriting the existing ones. So I just put the command figure in front of them. Now in order to save, to uh, use this later, we just simply save it. We can give it a title. Let's actually add some little more comments up front. Win data analysis analyze 
data from met tower. So if we can execute this script entirely using the command run here, or typing in the name of the script, or we can again publish a report, a simple report that we saw before. So you saw it before in HTML format. In this case, I'll show you in the Word file format. It says our publish command can generate an HTML, XML, LaTeX, Word document format, PowerPoint, and PDF. Publish. It's executing that script. In this case, it will take less time, just as we did in the beginning of this demonstration. In the end, we'll end up with a report, not in HTML format, but as a Word document. We can see we have a title, we have our text in our report, we have our analysis sections. So notice though this time that our cells in our script have become the sections in a report. That's the third and final benefit of cell mode. It controls the formatting of the report. This is just a simple Word document. There's nothing locked or secured about it. You can now go ahead and edit this further for your own use by adding additional comments, text, figures, whatever you need to do. So at this point, we've gone full circle. We've used MATLAB both interactively and programmatically to analyze our data. And we this also created new knowledge that goes beyond the, the report from before and gives us the ability to better predict performance and return on investment with our wind simulator. In the beginning of this webinar, I shared with you two important characteristics of software to do this analysis. One, I wanted to fully automate repetitive and standard tasks. We clicked one button in MATLAB and ended up with our standard report. The job was done. There was no other further import, input from us required. Two, I wanted the flexibility to explore interesting and unique phenomena. We mined our data and we created new knowledge in the form of a wind simulator that we can use later. This is new knowledge that puts us above and beyond everyone else. And MATLAB made this all possible. Now, are you ready to catch the wind?